Hello, everybody, and welcome to what I think is the crown jewel in the webinar series for Life Sciences Dream. And I am Dr. Shannon Gregg, and it is my extreme pleasure to be joined by this amazing panel today. They are worth the hype. So get ready, buckle in. This is going to be a really fun time. Life Sciences Dreamin' is a two-day conference that was established to help those of us that are at the intersection of go-to-market technology and the life sciences. I know when I started in eClinical, which was so long ago that Salesforce still had a loopy F and writing a report took a lot. <laughs> it took a lot out of you. Um, and in fact, guys, this was back in the days of electronic patient reported outcomes on Palm Pilots. Yes, indeed. That is how long I've been around. Uh, I know when I was owning Salesforce in those days, I was very lonely. I didn't have anybody to talk to about how to use Salesforce in the life sciences with all of its very specific intricacies. And that's where Life Sciences Dreamin was born. So we brought it together last year as a two-day conference in Fort Lauderdale. And this year it is going to be in the beautiful city of Philadelphia. So we can't wait to see you October 9th through 11th at the Life Sciences Dreamin conference. But until then, this is going to give you a really good idea of the type of programming you're going to see there. So today we are joined by Nasha Arsale, who is a transformation advisor and coach. She is going to lead this incredible panel through a few really cool questions about what is going on in the life sciences from their elevated experience. Life Sciences Dreamin' this year is sponsored by Cloud Adoption Solutions, Fido SEO, Wise Wolves, Spags Corp, Cloud Kettle, Loi.ai, and we know that we are going to see more of you join. So please reach out to us if you have questions about attending or sponsoring Life Sciences Dreamin'. I am going to shut my trap right now so I can hand it over <laughs> to you, Nasha, and introduce today's established and wonderful panel. Thank you so much, Shannon, and thank you to the sponsors who made last year possible and actually are going to make this upcoming year even more fabulous. This was not only a conference, it was a full experience, so I encourage everyone to join us this upcoming October. So I want to introduce these wonderful people that I have with me today, and I want to start with Wendy Cofran. Wendy has worn so many hats in technology sector, in the healthcare industry. So Wendy, why don't you introduce yourself? Thanks, Nisha. Um, as you mentioned, I, I have spent, uh, I think we're creeping up on almost 30 years. Uh, so yes, I'm familiar with the Palm Pilot, Shannon. Um, <laughs> I am the former digital strategy officer for healthcare at Salesforce and am currently the CEO and co-founder of Novosity, which is a, a go-to-market and strategy consulting firm. So uh, having a great time working in the ecosystem uh, and influencing and working with a lot of great people. Wonderful. Thank you, Wendy. The next that uh, we have is Dr. Chris Salinas, who is the head of uh, industry advisory and innovation at Salesforce. Dr. Salinas, I am going to let you introduce yourself. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the invite. It's great to be here. It's funny because the moment the Palm Pilot comment came up, I immediately remembered a conversation I did not have too long ago. I'm talking days ago where we went from having all of these books and lab coats, and those of you that have been in healthcare for a while will remember that, you know, points of reference constantly with dosing cards, <laughs> and you name it, to that Palm Pilot, and everybody thought we looked so cool just looking up different, you know, medications and dosing options that you have. So completely remember the Palm Pilot phase, uh, lived it. So I'm right there with you. So my name is Chris Salinas, and I lead our industry team across life sciences. These are business consultants, uh, as well as industry advisors that service trusted con consultants and, and advisors to our customers. But they're physicians, clinicians, and ex-industry executives at the end of the day that not only have been in the industry, but get to collaborate on the platform and share the great things that Salesforce is doing across not only healthcare, but also life sciences too. So it's great to be here. Thanks for the invite. Thank you so much, Dr. Salinas. Let's, next in line, we have Rachel Page, who is the Chief Commercial Officer, currently at Veristar. Rachel, why don't you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your wonderful experience? Thank you. I'm obviously and clearly too young to remember what a palm pilot is, <laughs> but uh, got me there. <laughs> I just had a very hard paper round. That's why I look like this now. The, um, <laughs> So I'm Chief Commercial Officer of Veristat. We are a scientific-based CRO. Loving it, just joined five months ago. 
and absolutely enjoying the thrill of being part of this work in this uh, market. So looking forward to this today. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Rachel. And last but not least, we have Dr. Julianne Baron. Julianne has way too many certifications for me to list here. So I'm going to let her introduce herself. She currently is the president of Science and Safety Consulting. So Julianne, why don't you give us a little bit of a snippet about you? Yeah, thanks. Uh, so I'm, as Aisha said, I'm the president and owner of Science and Safety Consulting. So um, I do consulting and provide services in um, laboratory safety, security, um, biosecurity, cyber biosecurity, and um, public health. And yes, I have too many credentials. <laughs> but <laughs> I will say that I think I am actually slightly too young for Palm Pilots. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank you, everyone. So let's get this party started. Last August, during our inaugural Live Sciences Dreamy, um, I loved it because all of the um, breakout sessions and the main themes were about innovation and about all the transformational initiatives to implement these new practices, these new technologies. And we also talk a little bit about our adoption, which I thought this panel basically brought everything together because the title is Mastering the Mundane to Forge the Future, which is actually what we have to battle every day. So with that, I am going to start with my first question. When it comes to these transformational initiatives, in your experience, what should come first? Should it be strategy first or budget allocation first? How about you, Wendy, from the technology standpoint? Why don't you get us started? I think you did that to me in August as well. You started with me. So that's unfair. You're picking on me twice, but that's all right. You're that's welcome. All right. And I think I gave you the, the less than uh, optimal answer of it depends. Um, if, if there are shifts in the business that happen, um, we can, we can look at what happened um, with cybersecurity issues with change healthcare. Um, your budget and your budget and strategy uh, might, might be very different. Uh, so when I'm thinking about how I want to position my company, um, I have to be thinking strategically about where I want to be in the future. But at the same time, I really have to take hard looks at my budget, especially in healthcare, because there are some non-negotiables that are always going to demand my budget. So it's it's a constant battle of, I think, the back and forth between how do we grow and innovate at the same time that we need to maintain the business and keep it running. So I, I think it's a constant battle. Yeah. Um, that truly deserves equal attention. Yeah, that totally makes sense. How about you, Dr. Salinas? What is your point of view on this? Yeah, so it, it's, I, I would say there's a third option in here and it's going to be the outcomes piece, right? It's you, many times you tackle on a new project or a new initiative across an organization and you might say, yep, I got to start with a strategy. What do I want to do at the end of the day? Okay, great. That's outstanding. What are you looking to address? Again, outstanding. It's a budget. Well, I've got to fit into a specific number to be able to have a solution adopted across the organization. Okay, that's great as well. Now you're looking at it from two key areas. Now, the third piece, and that's why I say the third piece is real important, is what are you looking to accomplish at the end of the day? Numbers aside from a finance standpoint, from a budgeting perspective, strategy of where do you start also aside, where do you want to end up? Is that closer to a customer or a patient? Are you looking to gather outcomes much faster that can help you accelerate R&D or transform your clinical trials approach or strategy? What is it that you're looking to get and what are those outcomes? Make sure you list them out. Once you've got those, then back into the, how long is it gonna take me to be able to get there? What is the foundation that I have today that then I need to build on top of that way you can identify what the budget needs. It's not the budget that you have, but the budget that you will need in order to accomplish the transformation that you're going to focus on. So that's the third piece that maybe I would throw on there. It's um, It may sound a little easy to say, start with the end in mind, but start with the end in mind, knowing exactly how you're going to gauge or what metrics you're going to have to show success. Otherwise, a strategy without those metrics is just a strategy and a goal that you've set, a vision, but that's not grounded in the outcomes or the metrics that you want to make sure that you can deliver upon. 
think I that. would also add in there resource because you need to determine if you have the internal resource or you're going to have to outsource or bring other resource in. So that, that's an extra layer I'm having to look at currently with what I'm with the new business model as well. So I've done exactly what you're saying. And I love it is, you know, looking at, yes, I've got the eye on the ball here, but I'm aware of the foundation of what we have. What do I need to get to that level? Can it be this year? Can it be spread over several years? But then who can lead it? Do I have anybody internally that has that expertise or even hunger? Sometimes it can, because it can be a development yeah. area for somebody. But is there anybody internally? And if there's not, then is that then I need to pivot different because the cost is going to be different then as a result. So I, I would add that too from personal experience right now. I love that, Rachel. Uh, and actually, both of your answers, Rachel and Dr. Salinas, and obviously Wendy, lead me to the following question, because this is something that I just went head against the wall so many times with the executives. We talk about strategy, then budget adjustments, and then evaluating and, you know, balancing everything together. How about in those moments that these transformations require a new technology, right? What, in your opinion, what should come first, the process improvement or the technology? Because I have heard both school of thoughts that the technology is gonna solve for everything in the planet. And from the other school of thought, no, let's take five years to clean up completely the process and then we'll think about the technology. What is your perspective uh, mm. in terms of process versus technology first? And, and it's hard because it, everybody has their day job as well. So this is an extra layer on top of that for them True. to say, pull the technology in, be a part of all the forum, the groups, etc., uh, user acceptance testing, et cetera, et cetera. So I definitely think if you have the process ironed out, it helps with any integration and new technology coming in. And you are making sure as well, it's going to benefit the company and the people. There's no point in rolling technology out for the sake of it. What's it? It's making sure there's buy-in from the team and they actually feel this is going to make a difference to them. Otherwise, it's just a great grand idea and, and it's just going to fall flat. So it's very, very important. And then, of course, the people want to be part of it and lead it, embed it in, and will incorporate it into their day-to-day -day activities. Otherwise, it's just going to lie dormant and be a waste of that budget that we were fighting for, as you've mentioned earlier. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think there's two things I'd add on to that as well mm -hmm. would be, you know, the importance of the buy-in from the folks that are that are using it, the boots on the ground type folks. Mm -hmm. um, because mm -hmm. if, the, if we're just throwing the technology out there and telling them they need to use it, but they're not finding value in it, that's quite candidly on, on leadership for not having taken that that time. Yeah. But the, mm -hmm. And that feeds into the second part that I, point that I wanted to make is that it's understanding your technology across your entire organization. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's many times we see, especially in healthcare, you know, this division or this department wants this technology, somebody else wants this, or God forbid, they've just spun it up on their own uh, because they had their own little budgets that they were operating. So I think it's really important to, to make sure that you understand the technology across the whole organization. I love that, Wendy, because the mo the thing that I heard the most is ent implementing an enterprise-wide technology and then going to each of the business leaders. No, we do a special. It needs to fit these special category. So I love your answer because without that visibility, uh, basically, it's going to be very, very difficult to ensure that there's adoption. Any other thoughts? Yeah. I'll, I'll say two. I think that... Um... One of the things to consider kind of with all technology solutions is sometimes there are, you know, let's say ready out of the box, mostly products. And then there are some you have to build from scratch. Mm -hmm. um, there's difficulty in both ends of that. Um, with the out of the box, sometimes it doesn't do things that you want, um, but you have to you know, as Rachel said, you have to know what you want the process to look like to know if you're okay missing some of those features 
or if there's another way that you can build in that that information that you need from technology. If you go the, you know, start from the bottom, co completely custom solution, you have to think about all the departments that might need it. But then you also have to think about very clearly, what do I want this technology to do? And how can I communicate that to the vendor so that they can build it to do what I want it to do? And it's sometimes there's a big discrepancy in being able to understand what all the product can offer and what you can even ask for it to be able to do. So there has to be people inside your team that have a really good understanding of what you want the process to look like, what the technology is capable of, and then how do you explain to the people who are building it, can I get from here to here? Or does it not work that way? Because a lot of times, um, very often you already have technology in place that can do more than you are expecting it can. And, and, uh, or it can do things that you didn't know that it did. So sometimes even just having a conversation with an existing vendor, you know, Hey, I, I've been thinking about trying to capture this kind of data. You know, is that something you guys can do? And having a conversation like, Oh yeah, you know, that's this button. We just didn't know it was there. And I, I think that happens too. I love that, Julianne. And actually, I'm going to tag along to your answer for my uh, next question. Um, uh, because understanding how good and great will look like definitely will give us the baseline. When we are doing that, and actually based on uh, the comments before of what do we want our company to look like and our new innovation to look like? How do we balance the new processes and new technology and new format that we are trying to bring as part of our innovation initiatives and the processes that not only work existently, but that our customers have gotten used to and they expect from us. How do we balance the old versus the new, especially the old that works? <laughs> Who wants to kick off? <laughs> I think we see this even as consumers today, right? What happens yeah. to some of the technology that we use day to day and it gets updated. And we're so accustomed to either the look, the feel, the way it moves from one screen to another, or the way it asks for specific information that I know it's going to require. And then it changes. Yeah. There's an update. They're making it better because they figured that they can kind of fine tune the way not only they're collecting the data, but how they're also going to give the user something in return uh, from an experience standpoint. That's something you've got to definitely keep in mind. It's are you understanding the way it's used today, but are you bringing those along to understand why is it that you want things to change or to become better? And that buy-in is going to be key. So one clear example is the shifts that we're seeing today from a healthcare perspective that now life sciences organizations need to adapt. In the past, we always saw the patient approach and we heard patient, patient, patient. Now we hear healthcare consumer and it's a different expectation. So whatever you're building or that you've built in the past, is it addressing what the needs of the market are towards the future? And that's a big question mark for every organization, right? It's, are you setting up a way that those that interact with you are able to see what you are looking to accomplish moving forward so they can easily adopt and adhere to why is it that you're requiring either specific input or using specific technology for them? So that's, yeah, that's what I would add to that. Definitely just say, Communication, it's the crux at the end of the day. It's uh, very much as you've have you said, Chris, it's like get, come back to that. If you have a clear communication path and an open communication with your customers and again, leading them through, this is why we're making the changes. This is a benefit of the changes we're making and the enhancements. And why not ask them for their input? Um, very, very, very simply in the industry I'm in, I'm sitting, we're doing a lot of proposals. So we've set up a customer forum where we've said we'd like to do a pilot. We want to change our proposals to make it more bespoke, but we'd love your input because we are making it more AI focused and trying to use that and, and make it more efficient. And the customers are going, oh my gosh, no other company has actually asked us that. They just send it to us and expect us to be happy with it. And we're like, no, we want that feedback. 
we want to understand how to make it better, more user friendly. What information do you like, you not like? Because that's going to make everybody's life easier. But we just need to stop sometimes, listen, ask the questions, and then make the decisions. I think sometimes we're just too quick to keep rolling out all these enhancements and think everybody's coming with us. And they're not on that journey, as you've just said. So need to get them on the train. Old, I've gone old style. I'm keeping with a pan pilot here. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, I'm going to pivot and switch gears a little bit because, Rachel, you mentioned uh, in the previous uh, question that, um, and Wendy, you reiterated that these transformation initiatives are literally the extra uh, huh. from the job description. Uh, everyone has their own job. Huh. And, you know, in the, the job description, that what it says, other uh, responsibilities, you're uh, slamming these massive uh, <laughs> initiatives behind the scene. In your experience, Rachel, and uh, anyone else who wants to uh, pitch in, what are the most typical challenges when um, we come with the prioritization of internal resources and how can we avoid those challenges? Yeah. It's interesting. It's actually making sure and educating others around that person who has the extra priorities and the, and the extra yeah. curriculum activities that they're all aware of that and yeah. are respectful of it. So I've found that I have to reiterate that time again, time again. It's like, oh, such and such isn't available. Correct. That's because one afternoon a week, their time is protected. So let's be respectful mm -hmm. of that because the benefit of it is going to be this. But we have to just carve that out. So the fact actually when, when I'm saying that to them, and I've had to reiterate it several times because it's an unheard of thing. It's things like, oh, I'm meant to do it as well as my duties and that I feel that's unfair it should be yeah carved out time um, and not meant to be added on and not meant I don't want them to do it begrudgingly that's what I'm trying to say I want them to see mm -hmm. it exactly we value you and your input and we're rewarding you not giving you extra responsibility that you have to do in your free time I But love that it's not always easy to do Um, but I think then that's where we need to look at people's workload and say, what can I delegate or take off you or reallocate? And let's go through it because this takes priority and this is important for the business and for your, your development. But it's a continuous review, though. You can't just set it up and then walk away. It, um, I just had a phone call this morning with somebody who I'd asked to do something with regards to new technology implementation and because it's quarter end she's not getting the response from everybody so we walked through a new plan had to walk her kind of off the ledge to get her understanding the context of how everybody's feeling and it's not personal and she's yes. like oh I get it now I get that. that's fine so I'll do it for here yes perfect and everybody was so respectful for her doing that then that she understood their priorities as well. So that was good. I love the example. I love the example. Any uh, additional comments? Yeah, yeah I think... I think... Oh, go ahead, Julian. Oh, oh, good. I was just going to say, I think it, it depends too. Um, you know, you want to make sure you pick a person who that's going to be a good priority for. Um, mm, great. If you, if you pick someone who maybe is doesn't like change or doesn't understand technology or, or, you know, oh, they just have a free time slot, we can fit it in. Um, it, it would be much harder than having someone who, you know, this is a pain point for me, I really want to explore this technology and um, figure out if there's a good way to move it forward. If you can pick a person that is interested in it, and you know, you obviously make it so that they have the time to prioritize it. But I think it really also depends on who you're giving that task to, how well mm -hmm. it's going to work and what experience they have with the problem that you're trying to have the technology solve. Because if you give it to someone who 
is interested and willing, but doesn't understand the the customer issue with the technology or the internal business issue with the technology, they're not going to be the most effective person to actually try something new out or put a new program into place. That totally makes sense. Wendy, you were going to add something. Well, to, to, absolutely. I think it's the, uh, you know, the two things I think as a, as a panel we talked about also was the look back sessions and making that a discipline yes. so that it gives you an opportunity to not let things creep outside of the, the typical scope that was there or the intent of the initiative and to identify, like Rachel mentioned, um, maybe it's a certain time of year for some, but not for others. And, you know, are, are we finding ways to, to be respectful for the process? And it's not just a one or two look back. It's a discipline. And I think, uh, Chris, you talked about that quite a bit, I think, in our panel and the importance of celebrating along the way. Um, yeah. Change is hard. Um, not everybody loves change. Just a few crazy people that happen to be put on a panel together think that change <laughs> is great. Um, but for the rest of the world, it's it's it drives a lot of anxiety. So yeah. um, the importance of celebrating and communicating and both of those things can happen um, at the same time as also being honest with yourselves. Are we do is this the right way we should be going or do we need to go? Oh, that didn't quite end up the way it is. I'm going to hit a stop and we're going to pivot. And this is why we're pivoting. And it's OK to pivot um, because it really needs to be a, a, a living, breathing thing. It's not just a one and done um, when you're doing when you're when you're looking at this yeah okay. and our, the one thing i would add is are you doing internal marketing and i use that term to make sure that you're sharing the content within the organization because you're right it may take folks additional work outside of the scope of where they're focused on today or additional bandwidth that they may not have or you know to rachel's point it's the end of the quarter and i that's really not a big attention that i've got right now to be able to focus on i've got to focus on something else that's okay but Whenever we have these wins and we're celebrating, just as Wendy mentioned, are we sharing that and doing that internal marketing so others are able to see outside of the folks that are working on it? Because then what happens is the next time you have another initiative that you want to focus on and roll up, it's no longer a, let me go find who can help me do this on top of their day to day. But you're going to see hands that are going to go up immediately say, I, I want to be a part of whatever you're working on next time. Think about me, put me on that list, and then definitely reach out because I am I want to collaborate with you. I love and that. Through my head thinking, have we done that? And if we haven't, I'm going to do that. Thank you for that. <laughs> I love it. I, I, have know. I have a question I'd like to ask, if that's okay. Yes, absolutely. Um, because I'd love to know something I have done in the past, and I'd love to know if anybody else does this or if it's, it's normal, is whoever's been the, the biggest... Um, non-conformist I'm trying to be very diplomatic here uh, <laughs> so I would usually pick them as part of the group to help the change because I think if I can change their mind they're going to help everybody else buy in I'm seeing lots of heads lots of nodding heads so would you yeah you yes. would do that well in the group okay good yes good. Uh, absolutely I will have a conversation first uh, at least that had been my experience yeah. just so that they do not sabotage your efforts in public uh yeah. but after that oh absolutely <laughs> you are so amazing driving people that I'm going to grab you in <laughs> and make you part of the team you're welcome Love for it. that yeah. you know what? I'll the give you most, a great the most vocal as well so it's yeah. not just the person that, yeah, the most yeah. vocal, right? That they're always either saying things are not going well, I don't like this, this is not going to work. But whenever yeah. they're a part of an initiative and things are going well, they're also going to be the most vocal to say, this is actually going to work. And this is actually working well, right? So yeah. Yeah. leverage yeah. that for yeah. sure. I, it's, actually, it's, uh, Dr. Salinas, I love it because I typically, uh, for my initiative, pick three people, the loudest, the most okay. vocal, the historian, which is the person that has been there forever, mm -hmm. and the quietest that have that inner knowledge but refuse to talk. Mm -hmm. Every single time that I would do a, a, you know, a road show throughout my different departments, I would target those three personalities. So uh, I love, love the answer. How hey, about I'll give, great, I, I I'll give you guys a great story to, to around yes. that. It's just after Palm Pilots, so I was a CIO. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we were we were putting all of our clinicians in the post acute space on laptops, and we had um, some some 
older nurses who tried and true. And what's really interesting is two of my older nurses just were, this is never going to work. It's not for me. I can't even operate my flip phone. So, okay, just above the Palm Pilot, I got the flip phone. <laughs> um, what was really interesting, they ended up as we were, cre- we had, we were helping this company build the first cloud-based EMR. And what became really interesting is because they didn't look at the technology in the course of their job. They actually were one of the most efficient feedback groups. Wow. And so everything came to, as we were looking how to design some of these things, it was, well, I wouldn't use that because of this. And it got engineers and designers thinking differently because, and they brought it into how to take care of the patient and how to do things. And so even though they were the ones who thought they were the worst, going to be the worst end users, ended up being the fastest trained and the ones that embrace the tech more than the younger ones who I love that. thought they would do that. So it's a great point that you make. Oh, I love that. I love, love, love that. Um, Julianne, I'm going to start with you for this next question, because I, I uh, in your experience, you have a lot of uh, oversight over risk. When we talk about also resources, both external resources, what lessons can you share about external vendors and, and the vendor selection process and re- external resources selection process? Um, these are high impact initiatives that are, uh, you know, very risky to the organization. It's already risky enough to involve internal resources that are sometimes overextended. What lessons can you share in terms of external resources and mitigating risk there? Yeah, I mean, I I, I would think about this in two ways. So the first part is, um, you know, when you're looking at vendors, I think some of a risk is, can the product do what I want it to do? And that's, again, from this process flow and making sure you understand what you need it to to be able to do. And and kind of to Wendy's question or to her point to the last question, um, if you have people who just know what they want to have happen and have no preconceived notion of how something should work, a lot of times those are good people to, um, you know, talk with the vendor. Like, I really would like something that did blah. Can you do this? And then they have to think about how can they get around and, and do that kind of thing? I think the other thing, uh, you know, that, that we want to talk about with vendors is um, obviously we're thinking cybersecurity features and and with some obviously recent um, incidents, um, you know, you, you want to think about also kind of what you're getting from vendors and um, with obviously AI and, and that being incorporated into so many new things, some of the thing that you need to think about is typically when a product is free uh, or a program is free, you are the product. So they're yeah. using your information and your data. And this happens a lot with language models and with AI. They're using your data to train their system. Mm-hmm. So a question is, is that appropriate for the kind of work that you do um, with you know, patient records and sensitive information? It might not be something that you want the vendor to be able to train their model on that data. And there yeah. are certainly ways to have agreements with vendors that are using AI or language models. Um, where your data is kept inside your organization, it doesn't leave. They um, basically, it's it's a one-way door. They can use outside information to better educate their model, but they're not using your information to go elsewhere. Hmm. So I think when we're thinking of vendors as well, you know, it's, can they do what you want them to do? Are they willing to, and can they have conversations with you about it? And then what happens to your information, um, especially when we're thinking about moving forward and, and lab automation systems, we're thinking about AI and all of that, you know, the privacy and security of your data and your organization's data and patient health records is obviously paramount. And it's really thinking about how is the vendor protecting that and how are they protecting you? 
I love that, Julianne. Um, I sometimes, because it has been a vendor that we have for a long time, we dismiss some baseline checkpoints. And I love that you brought that to everyone's attention. Anything else, Wendy and Rachel, from your perspective that we should take into consideration when we are considering external resources to help us with these transformations? Yeah, I think it actually goes back to how we started the panel. Um, you know, do you, is it, is it a part of your budget and your strategy? Um, yeah. and it really has to be, um, you know, when you start thinking about security and, and protecting things, it's as much about your culture, um, as yes. it is just about the vendor and what are the expectations? Um, and I think that's again, the importance of the, the communication of what is our positioning? What is our strategy? What is our culture? And that has to be clearly communicated both internally and to the vendor. Um, and it has to be, when you get into the you know budget discussions, it has to be, you know, this isn't a one-off. We, yes, nobody wants to be on the front page of anything um, for, for a breach, but the reality is at some point in time, there's probably gonna be a breach anywhere in your organization. So yeah. how, do you, how do you make sure that it's ingrained in everyone um, every day and everything that they do, they think about it. I can, I can cause as much trouble just by opening my mouth to somebody that's pretending to be somebody in my front door than I can for leaving my computer unlocked. And so that's not always associated when people think about security and budgeting towards training and, and different resources. So it really is holistic in, in what we talked about earlier. Yeah. I actually have to agree with that when the, uh, I used to work in a financial institution, incredibly regulated, and they were hammering so much that, and that was about 10 years ago, that was hammering so much that to this day, my 80 something year old mother calls me and says, like, someone asked me for my telephone number. I am not going to give it to them. So it works, people. It works. Right. <laughs> Rachel, you were going to add, you were gonna add something. <laughs> I'm going to go kind of left field because I love to try and help startups. And I love to have conversation. I had a conversation this week with a company to see if we could, for want of a better phrase, scratch each other's backs. Um, so if I could help them, but they're also helping me with something that they are developing at the present that would be a benefit to this me as a company, but also then would help the greater good going forward. So I love coming at it from that perspective. And I understand that my data is going to be utilized, but it's a benefit for me is the way I'm looking at it and, and vice versa. So if it helps change um the industry the market the way we do things i love i love that so i ha that's the kind of thinking i have whenever i have now don't get me wrong i don't want every single startup company phoning me and saying can we work with you i'm very selective but if i see that there is a, going to be a benefit for not just my company but wider um, i'm all in to help and support with that in any way whether it be just a conversation or actually pulling them into the company either or talking about continuing with the risk aspect um how can we protect our companies from the not so obvious risk from these um initiatives whether internal and external you know we have talked about vendors and vetting them and asking the questions comparing it to our strategy budget um how about the not so obvious risks that these transformational initiatives typically bring? What, what have you seen and how can we avoid those risks? I think it's in maybe your, your approach to vendors. And, and what I mean by that is it should be a symbiotic relationship. Um, when it becomes unbalanced, I think is when, when problems start to happen. Um, and that could mean, you know, do we need to do a better job vetting the vendors beforehand? Um, I can give you an example of uh, when I was a CIO, I think the shortest term I had with a vendor when I left was 10 years. Um, wow. But the expectation was that I needed them. I work in healthcare. I needed them to be available. If my systems went down, then my staff couldn't treat the patients. 
So if you understand my priorities and when I'm reaching out to you, it's not correct. Like you need to be there. On the flip side of that, I would give them my time or marketing time or be present to speak to other customers. So there's multiple ways to create a really strong relationship with vendors I love um, that. as opposed to just, hey, there was a really great salesperson. They got me into this and I don't love the relationship I have with the company. And I think that is it's an intangible, but it becomes so important that when things are going good, nobody really realizes it. But when things go badly, that's when you have to come at it and be able to have a relationship where it's a united front. Mm-hmm. It's never going to be perfect, but you have to be able to have those conversations. I love that. I absolutely love that. Yeah. Uh, I Go ahead, oh, Julia. Sorry. I, I was going to say, you know, another perspective of risk is, um, you know, it, if you're thinking about implementing a new program or a new technology or a strategy, um, to Wendy's, you know, point from before, you want to think about all the different departments, but you also want to think, is there really a business need or a business case for what I'm trying to do? Because exactly. if you can't demonstrate to leadership management director of the company, you know, we need this and not just we need this right now, but we need this every year for until we are not a company anymore. Um, The sustainability piece, I think also is something you have to think about of, you might have a budget to put this into place right now. Do you have a budget both from a personnel standpoint and from a financial standpoint to maintain whatever system that you're going to have? Can you have those long-term relationships with vendors because you're consistently using that product is it solving your problem? And and that should probably be a part to think about as, as risk. So, you know, when we do in the safety space, when we do risk mitigation in the cyberspace, you do your assessment, you figure out what you want to put into place to mitigate your risk, but it's not over then. You keep going back in a circle and checking. So is your solution still meeting the need And if not, how do you fix it so that you can keep kind of going on this circle and making sure that you are meeting your business need, you're fixing the issue, and that you're not just creating yourself a big problem that no one is looking at kind of moving forward. And it's a risk um, with vendor technology. It's a risk with actual physical technology devices. where if you don't have the ability to maintain and sustain them, they're either not going to do what you want them to do, they're going to become insecure, or people are not going to use them the right way because they can't do what they need to do anymore. That's a great, great consideration. Um, I have one final question, and this is a teaser for what's coming in October so that everyone attends and listens to this live and enjoys the experience. So we have talked about strategy. We have talked about budget. We have talked about the countless presentations on business plans, right, and engagement. What about our teams? How can we ensure we maintain our teams engaged in these large scale initiatives that take a toll on everyone, even the janitor actually wants us out of there. So how can we ensure that everyone is still going strong, you know, many months after we kick off? Wendy, I'm gonna start with you. I knew you were gonna do that. Okay, I thought you were gonna announce a giveaway of a Palm Pilot or something, and I was all set for that. Okay, um, it's it, I hate to be a broken record, but I, I think it's it's your process and and um, how consistently. I don't want to say it's always a look back, but as you're going, um, are there ways, whether officially or unofficially, that you're measuring your progress, successes, and failures? Uh, yeah. So that people can see that it is a true initiative that um, has value and has a goal. Um, because if people just, it, and that kind of comes back into the shiny object syndrome. Did somebody yes. just come up with this really great idea and, and a whole bunch of people ran with it, but it had no purpose, no vision, no North Star, I think is the word that I'm looking for. And so 
I think that's where leadership really needs to look at um, making sure that the North Star and the vision is clearly articulated. It's not a straight line to get there, which also should be clearly articulated. And then keeping everybody involved along the way so they can see progress. I love that. Rachel, how about you? Yeah, I was going to say, not a band-aid. I'm going very American when I say that. Uh, we would say a plaster, just for those that are out there. But uh, making sure that from across the, the whole company, it's worthwhile. But also looking at, um, that is this scalable, first and foremost? Or have we, I, I've gone into very, various companies in the past, and I'm finding they go for the best of breed and the biggest names when they don't need it. And in fact, yeah. it's created too much uh, red tape for them and they struggle and they fall over it when they could have had a more nimble, easier system that could have grown with them. And they're trying to be big corporation before they're ready for it. And that's only tempered their, their feeling. They're thinking it's not worth it then. So back into that, what is the process? What is the problem you're trying to solve for? And then have that discussion, as Julianne and Wendy have both said, with those vendors to say, this is what I'm trying to get to. What, what solution do you have? You may already have it in-house. Nine times out of ten, you find you do, actually. And yeah. we just haven't harnessed it in the right way. So it's very important to have those questions first internally before you start going to the shiny and I am a big fan of shiny new objects. I am who I am. <laughs> I'm terrible for that. And I'm very lucky I've got a team around me who I go with this blue sky stuff going, I want this, I want this. And they go, okay, and breathe. And we're <laughs> but, so yeah. good to have advisors is what I'm going to say. Very yeah. good to have that. Yeah, I'll just really quick. Um, I'll add, I, I know someone mentioned earlier, um, you know, celebrating sort of successes of of the mm -hmm. the solution and you know it shouldn't necessarily just be the initial yes we got it off the ground it started you know maybe there's more internal follow-up um getting more stakeholders in your company to say um you know hey uh this department uh this month you know here's our survey form tell us what you like and what you don't like about it share it at a, you know, all hands or a staff meeting, what the results are, or if there are new features, you know, share them with internal staff, and then they can relay them to clients or customers. If um, somebody ever asks them, why did this change? You know, I really yeah. liked it when it was doing this. Um, but, you know, don't lose track necessarily of celebrating progress as it continues to happen and you keep people engaged and then you can kind of uh, build more internal support. And I, as Chris was saying before, you know, then you have more people that are like, wow, this is a great initiative. Yeah. I want to be involved in the next one. I'm going to put my hand up and say, I, I want to be on the team for, you know, next project implementation. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. I would like now to invite the Cloud Adoption Solutions team uh, because I'm sure that we have questions from the audience. Uh, so if anyone can help a little bit with those, that would be fantastic. <laughs> This is amazing, incredible. I love that you guys are so alive and on fire and we're running around from mastering the mundane and looking at things in the past, uh, Palm Pilots, old school nurses. Um, <laughs> Wendy hasn't talked about faxes yet, but I know it's in her. And then <laughs> thinking about the future, which I think is going to be a big focus. You know, nobody can stop talking about AI. So yes. that, you know, we could sit here for days and listen to you all talk about these really critical and important things. But we do have two particular questions that I would love to throw out there. Um, adoption plans are critical when investing in a new tech or process. How can you ensure a successful process for those plans? I think we've touched upon that quite a, quite a bit already. And it is that engagement, making sure you've picked the right people as part of that um, and taking the communication style and, and pace and bringing everybody with you. And then, as, as Chris and Julianne mentioned earlier, is celebrating those wins as you go away and, and keeping them engaged, which I'm going to go back and do myself and make sure <laughs> I 
and uh, I want to wrap everyone's point together because it's something that I use very often in my uh, transformational initiatives, which was an inclusive engagement model, communicating constantly, authentically, consistently, and with what's happening in real time so that everyone don't start to make assumptions of what they see and truly hear about the core team, what is the progress and validating that value proposition. I love it so much. I think, at least I know you guys all know, but I did do my doctoral research on Salesforce user adoption and all the things that you talked about are it. You know, it's quick wins, giving people stretch projects. Um, yeah. The communication is critical. And I love it. I love that, you know, we just, everybody wants more information on this. Um, last question. And then I am sorry that we have to close this party out because it's been such a high spot of my week. But how do you feel about managing economic change this year. I know um, we've seen like really wild economic shifts the past couple of years. So how do you guys think that's going to impact the life sciences? Can we just start that one as well? <laughs> uh, do I look like the impact is affecting me? Uh... You look wonderful, Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a rough ride, let me tell you. I am seeing the green shoots though, which I'm loving. I have a lot of investors that I work with. I'm very fortunate, but, and Jeannie Hecht, I don't know if anybody saw that. She sent a wonderful post out earlier in this week to see the investment going into the biotechs and the amount of money and funds that's being released. And it was just, I was like, yes, at last we're seeing a change. And I feel it and I sense it. Look at how many people were at scope this year did anybody see that how the thousands that attended this year phenomenal I can see the shift from where we were there's still a way to go and obviously that does impact decisions on a budget etc but I, I see um, the moths coming out of people's wallets we're starting to see a little bit of movement they're opening up we still need to pry them a little bit, but they're opening up. So I think by the H2, heading into 2025, there'll be a more positive outcome, but we still have a way to go. Actually, I want to add something to what Rachel just said, is that internally, and everyone has touched on this, and I'm just repeating what these wise people just said, is internally to watch your culture because even your economic decisions will speak about your culture. So in those tough times, go back to your mission statement. What are you for? Yes, you're pursuing something to do what you're doing right now much better, but what do you stand for? Who do you do it for and why? And that will help you make a prioritization that fosters even more credibility internally within your culture. Yeah, I'll, I'll add one thing that I, you know, I, I brought up earlier, we were thinking about risk and sustainability, you know, having an influx of funding, obviously fantastic. Um, but you have to think about what that looks like later. Uh, so I, yes. we've definitely seen situations where people have built new buildings, new labs, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, five years, they can't run them. They don't have the funds uh, to maintain staff. They don't have the funds to run the the lab or the building. And so it it's thinking about, you know, what does this look like for me now? But then what do I want it to look like in the future? And how do I plan to make something a change that is long lasting and not just you know, I have all this money, I'm going to buy something now. And then two years later, you can't afford the vendor product, you have to switch the whole thing. And your clients are all upset because it doesn't work the same way that it did. That's a great point. Really great point. And I think, you know, it brings home the point that Wendy made when we first started putting this panel together back in the Palm Pilot days. Um, <laughs> thinking about mm -hmm. how you build sustainable change. And a lot of times yes. that is 
making sure you're mastering what was mundane. So pulling in on your best practices, on the folks in your network that can help you with the best practices. And Rachel, so glad you mentioned scope. Events are back. We're seeing that they're back. So, yeah. so cool to see everybody back out there learning, moving things forward, attending events like this, whether they are online or on ground is such a great way to make sure that your brain is continuing to dance mm -hmm. around and keep things getting better. And to that end, I want to thank this wonderful, remarkable panel and Dr. Salinas. Thank you all so much for joining us last year, today, and this year. I heard you better keep Keep your dancing shoes shined and polished. We <laughs> are planning a fall ball at the Life Sciences Dream and Conference. So, Rachel, I know full well you'll be the first one on the dance floor. So I'll see you there, sister. I'll see you there. No problem. <laughs> Challenge accepted. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, so much for joining us today. This was beautiful, wonderful. Um, I appreciate every single one of you for spending your time with us. And we will see you on the next Life Sciences Dream and webinar. Have a great day.